everyone hear me okay in the back? Okay, awesome. Thanks, Liliana, for the introduction and the invitation. It's been super fun to be here. Um, so, it's not clear. from early in our history, evolutionary biologists have thought of speciation in terms of this branching tree. Um, but even in the time of Darwin, we realized that this was an oversimplification of the actual process of divergence between lineages. And if we were going to redraw this classic figure in evolutionary biology today, we might represent it more like this, um, with sort of um, strands of, of gene flow connecting um, lineages before, during, and after divergence. Um, and this is certainly true in the species group that we have focused on as a model system for this process, the swordtail fish. Um, so this is a group of, of freshwater fish found mainly in Mexico and into Central America. Um, and I started working on this group as an early PhD student. Um, and one of my first PhD projects has really sort of changed my thinking about the importance of hybridization as an evolutionary process. So in this project, we were trying to reconstruct the phylogenetic relationships between species in this clade. Um, and what became very evident um, in our, our RNA-seq data, which contained um, several thousand genes, is that there was substantial discordance in this phylogeny. Um, so, um, and a subset of these discordant events, we were able to attribute using other methods to, to instances of major gene flow. Um, so what you can see here is the sort of inferred um, majority genome relationships between the species in this group, um, but also these, these swatches across the phylogeny of both ancient and contemporary hybridization events. Um, and what, what we saw in this project was that in many of the species that we're studying today, large proportions of the genome, upwards of 10 to even 30 percent, appear to be derived from hybridization. Um, and so this um, really hit home for me that hybridization is sort of a reality of the genomes that we study, um, and we need, to start, we need to integrate it formally into our understanding of different evolutionary processes. Um, so um, in thinking about that, I think there are several different ways in which hybridization can, can influence genome evolution um, and, and the evolution of populations. And so the one that I'm going to focus on today and most of my work is focused on is this idea that hybrids um, can have these genetic conflicts caused by combining two divergent genomes, um, and that these genetic conflicts can shape the way that the genome evolves after hybridization. Um, but this is just sort of a small slice of what's going on when you have hybridization. Um, we also know that hybridization can have ecological consequences. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, so, um, for example, if, if the parental species are adapted to different ecological niches, hybrids may sort of have um, an a unfavorable intermediate phenotype, or hybrids can have novel phenotypes in some cases that allow them to invade new habitats. So it's, it can be often difficult to predict the ecological outcomes of hybridization. Um, and we also know that hybrids um, can um, experience selection from behavioral, um, from a behavioral perspective. So um, one of the things that we certainly see in swordtail fish is that hybrids have a mix of secondary sexual characteristics from the two species. Um, they can be intermediate. They can have recombinant cases um, uh, of trait combinations. And so this in, in different species groups and in different circumstances could either promote their ability to find mates or, or limit it. Um, so even though I'm going to focus on sort of one part of this, I, I want to highlight that there's a lot we still don't understand about hybridization in many contexts. Okay, so the work that I'm going to tell you about today focuses on um, our, our main model system for understanding hybridization in, in my lab. Um, and this is hybridization between two closely related swordtail fish species, um, Xiphophorus malinche, which is found at high elevations, and Xiphophorus birchmani, which is found at low elevations um, in uh, central eastern Mexico. Um, and these species have about a half a percent sequence divergence, um, which of course you can see reflected here in, um, in their morphological divergence. Um, they also differ in a suite of ecological traits and, and species-specific behaviors, um, which unfortunately I won't have time to talk about today. But just to give you sort of a sense of um, 
the ecological gradient over which these species are found. Um, Malinche we find in high elevation habitats. They live in um, the cold headwaters of, of these streams. Um, we've measured temperatures in the winter as low as seven degrees Celsius at these sites, which is quite cold for the region. Um, by contrast, birch manai is found at, at low elevations, um, summer temperatures topping 35 degrees Celsius. Um, and, and so there's quite a strong ecological differentiation in terms of temperature between these two species. By contrast, hybrids we find over a whole range of intermediate elevations. Um, and we find um, you know, mismatches between genome-wide ancestry and elevation and thermal tolerance. So um, that's kind of an exciting direction that we're starting to dig into. Um, but the thing that I think is actually really um, unique and powerful about the system and one of the reasons that I've chosen to, to keep um, bringing it with me as I move to different places is that um, because of the geography of the rivers in this region, um, we actually have replicated hybrid populations. So Malinche is found at, at high elevations and feeds into this river system, and birch manai does the same at low elevations, um, such that the populations meet independently at intermediate elevations. Um, and so um, the hybrid populations themselves are not connected to each other, and we can look at these different instances of hybridization as sort of a a replicated experiment of recombining these parental genomes. And that allows us to ask what sorts of features seem to be kind of population or demographically specific, and what do we see over and over in different populations. Okay, so for all the data that I'm gonna be telling you about today, we rely really heavily on um, local ancestry inference. Um, so I'm gonna walk you through the, the basic approaches that we use, but I'm happy to talk in more, in more detail about these approaches. They're sort of our bread and butter. So um, we have sequenced to high depth the Malinche and Birchmanai genomes and several parental populations of 60 individuals per parental population. Um, so we have a very good understanding of the informative sites that differ between the populations, their frequency, and which of those are fixed differences. And so this allows us to go out into the hybrid populations and collect a small fin clip um, extract DNA and sequence it to about 1x coverage genome Y. Um, and then basically what we do is we take those reads and we map them to both the Malinche and Birchmanai genome. Um, and then we apply a hidden Markov model using our counts at ancestry informative sites that are fixed differences between the parental species to infer local chunks of ancestry. Um, so for, for example, this is a chromosome from our Tlatamaco hybrid population. Um, and what you can see here is this, um, these um, regions that are homozygous birch mite for ancestry shaded in blue, um, the regions that are homozygous Malinche for ancestry, and then these unshaded regions are high confidence heterozygous for ancestry. So one haplotype from birch mite, one from Malinche. And so for a typical hybrid individual, this gives us um, ancestry information at about a million sites throughout the genome. So this is extremely dense, high coverage information of the, the history of each region of the genome and each individual. Um, so this is, is really useful for some general things, and then I'll dive into some of the specific things we use it for. Um, so it can allow us to understand the structure of our different hybrid populations. Um, so for example, these plots are showing the genome-wide distribution of ancestry in each of our three hybrid populations. And you can see that you know, um, some of our populations derive the majority of their genome from the birch mite parent, while as others de derive the majority of their genome from the Malinche parent. Um, and we can also see some uh, hints of differences in demography here, um, where this um, population appears to have more variation in ancestry. Um, and we can dig into those, um, the, the ancestry calls in those individuals and see that they're the offspring of migrants from the Malinche population and the resident hybrid population. So that allows us to sort of understand some of the population history in more detail. Um, another thing that we can do with this kind of data is ask sort of specific questions about the origin of these populations. Um, so one really useful tool when you have local ancestry data is the sort of fact that in a first generation hybrid, you have a whole chromosome from parent species one and a whole chromosome from parent species two. 
And over time, recombination is going to break apart those chromosomes and generate this sort of um, fragmented chromosome like we see in natural hybrids. Um, but that, that process of breaking down those contiguous tracts of ancestry can actually be treated as a clock of the time since hybridization began. And of course, there are some assumptions that go into this, but we can actually fit a curve to the decay in admixture linkage disequilibrium and, um, and estimate when the hybrid populations formed. Um, and so one of the sort of early observations we had about these populations um, was that they appear to have formed quite recently. Um, so all of our populations, we estimated at the time, um, formed within about 30 or 60 generations since our initial sampling. Um, so that, that puts all of these populations as having formed within the last um, 30 to 40 years or so. Um, so this was really exciting to me, given the things that I'm interested in, um, because it suggested that these are young hybrid populations. And young hybrid populations may still be sort of in the process of sorting out any conflicts that could exist between their parental genomes. Um, and so this is something that we were really focused on, on trying to understand um, with good sort of theoretical basis. So one of the foundational theories in evolutionary biology, which um, likely everyone will be familiar with, is this idea that hybrids are incompatible. Um, so hybrids can have increased inviability, increased infertility. Um, and the sort of uh, foundational theory behind that is this idea proposed jointly by Dobzhansky and Muller um, that you have these ancestral populations that can subdivide into daughter populations, shown here in purple and blue. And these daughter populations, if they're evolving independently, will begin to accumulate and fix new mutations. And these mutations um, are either going to be neutral or advantageous in their genomic background. Um, but if these species come back together and hybridize, those mutations will not have seen each other before. And you can have negative interactions between them. Um, and we, as far as we know from much of the mapping that's been done in, in the lab and in some in natural populations, um, this appears to be the genetic mechanism that underlies most of these negative hybrid phenotypes that we see. Um, so we were really interested in whether we could use these, na these big natural hybrid populations and lots of genomic data derived from them to try to understand genome-wide the architecture of where these incompatible sites might be and um, what sort of general genomic features might be associated with resistance to introgression. Um, so I'm going to walk you through sort of briefly some of the broad scale observations that we've made and then dive into a specific example we've been working on lately. Um, so we used associations between ancestry in the genomes of each of our three hybrid populations to identify sites that always co-occur together in a particular ancestry state. And these can be viewed as, as candidate hybrid incompatibilities. So I'm showing you um, these sites which we previously identified on the sword-tailed genome. And one of the first surprises to us was that there were so many of them between these recently diverged species. Um, and so we've, we've been pushing these candidates a little bit further and trying to understand how they might be impacting evolution in the hybrid populations where they're segregating. Um, and one of the exciting things that we've seen is that um, if you sort of focus on ancestry in these regions and compare it to the rest of the genome, you'll see that this ancestry is quite unusual. Um, so if you um, look at this plot here, we have our three hybrid populations. Um, and then in red, we show average ancestry for the minority parent species at, hybrid, at putative hybrid incompatibilities compared to the genomic background. Um, and what we've interpreted from this is that these regions um, that sort of show this non-random pattern of segregation in hybrid populations are actually changing in frequency and becoming more extreme in their ancestry over time. Another um, observation that, that we've made with this kind of data is um, that there are certain annotations that quite strongly predict where in the genome you're going to find ancestry from the minority parent species. So one that has been really clear um, is an impact of recombination rate. Um, so regions of the genome with low recombination, where recombination events occur rarely, 
we believe to be more likely to be linked to some of these incompatible sites. Um, and as a result, we see that these regions are uh, much less likely to retain minority ancestry um, as you look across the genome in a hybrid population. Um, so recombination rate is sort of the, the strongest genome-wide factor that we see, um, but controlling for recombination rate, we also see a secondary effect of coding and conserved base pairs where um, regions that contain more coding or conserved base pairs have lower minor parent ancestry. Okay, so I've just taken you through some of the general observations about how the genome might be constrained by the locations of these hybrid incompatibilities and other functional features of the, of the way recombination occurs and where coding and conserved base pairs are. Um, what I'm gonna focus on for the rest of my talk um, is a particular hybrid incompatibility that we've been working on recently and have been really trying to get to the bottom not only of the genetics, but what it's actually doing in natural hybrid populations. So to tell you about this incompatibility, I need to start off by telling you about a trait. So this trait is called the spotted caudal. It's a collection of, of, of these melanocytes that are on the caudal fin of Xiphophorus birchmani. Um, so it's usually seen as this discrete spot. Um, and we see that it's at intermediate frequencies typically in Birchmanite populations. Um, but in Malinche, it's been lost. Um, and one of our first sort of hints that something unusual was going on with this trait was that as we collected individuals from hybrid populations, we saw the trait was at extremely high frequencies. Um, and this is surprising because given the ancestry in those populations, we would have expected the trait to be lower frequency than what we see in Birchmani. Um, and so this is sort of one feature that might ex that suggests there might be some kind of interaction between the Birchmani and Malinche genome that is sort of changing the expression of this trait. Um, but if we sort of look in more detail at, at characteristics of the trait, that becomes clearer. So if we ask about the area uh, the sort of area normalized for body size that's melanized outside of the fin, um, we see a very striking difference between Birchmani, which basically never has melanization outside of the fin, and hybrids that have varying degrees of melanization spreading out of the fin. Um, and to give you a sense of, of what that looks like in some hybrid populations, um, I'm gonna show you an individual from this part of the distribution in our Chihuahua Falls hybrid population. Lag for suspense. Okay, um, so this is an individual um, that has basically um, transitioned from um, an individual that had sort of a Birchmai-like spot over time to this really extreme melanization that's basically taken over the caudal fin, but has also gone into the body cavity. Um, and we have, um, I'll show you in a minute, um, here we go. Um, we've raised individuals in the lab of both Birchmani and hybrid populations, and we can actually track um, the expansion of the melanin spot over time. And what you see is that um, even though Birchmani typically does expand over time, the expansion is slight, and we still don't see the spot moving outside of the fin. By contrast, in hybrids, um, we see um, pretty extreme expansion in some cases. Um, and here's a hybrid individual at four and then six months. And you can see in this individual in particular, we've had um, some pretty dramatic expansion of this melanin. So um, we suspected that this might be the case um, given what was known about melanin patterns in swordtails but we've teamed up with some, some cancer biologists and have been able to show that this invasion that's going on is actually a malignant melanoma that is um, forming from the spot. So what I'm showing you here is a cross section of the caudal peduncle, which includes these muscle bundles, and all of these cells around them and sort of invading some of the bundles as well are melanoma cells. Um, so we sort of looked at this in a little bit more detail. So we, we've histologically characterized many of the hybrid melanomas um, and matched up to different phenotypes. We can also see really stark gene expression shifts. Um, 
in particular, we see dedifferentiation um, and um, sort of these um, expansions of, of um, uh, melanization pathways and pigmentation pathways, as well as several cancer-related pathways. Um, so we, we became really interested in trying to understand whether this melanoma we were seeing in hybrids was sort of a classic hybrid incompatibility and whether we could understand the genetic basis of it. So we took a couple of different approaches to try to get at that question. The first was to um, use a genome-wide association scan to identify the basis of the spot itself in Xiphophorus birchmanii. And this is something we can only do because the spot is polymorphic in birchmanii. Um, and this allows us to compare allele frequency differences throughout the genome between these two phenotypes. Um, and then the second approach we took, um, which I'll talk about in a moment, was an admixture mapping approach. Um, so focusing first on the GWAS, um, when we look at the entire genome for allele frequency differences between spotted and unspotted individuals, we do see some signal elsewhere in the genome, but our strongest signal is on chromosome 21. And if we zoom in on that chromosome, um, it's quite interesting that we actually see two separate peaks. Um, and the first peak is a gene that is involved in melanosome transport called MYRIP. Um, and so this, this is a gene that is important in um, moving around the melanosomes um, uh, in sort of relation to the melanocyte. Um, so we were interested in this gene because obviously it has a clear function. It's the only gene under this second GWAS hit peak. Um, but one of the things that we noticed was that it's actually not expressed at the right time to be involved in melanoma. So um, if you look at expression, um, regardless of spotting phenotype, um, at the time in which melanoma develops, we don't see evidence of expression of this gene in the right tissue. Um, so our sort of speculative thought about what's going on with this particular GWAS hit is that um, perhaps it's important in the early patterning during development, the spot forms very early in life, maybe this gene is involved in that piece of the pattern, and that's why it's not being expressed during the time that we're um, seeing the development of melanoma. Um, but this is something that, that we can look at in more detail since we are able to raise these fish in the lab. Okay, so the second GWAS hit is, um, is something that we have focused on quite a lot. So this is a gene called Xmark. And we were both sort of surprised and, and excited to see this, this result um, because Xmark has been implicated in a hybrid melanoma in a very distantly related cross of sore tails. Um, so lab crosses between Xiphophorus heleri and Xiphophorus maculatus generate this whole body melanoma um, from the speckles that are normally found on the maculatus body. Um, and uh, I was quite surprised to see this because the phenotype, um, even though it's a melanoma in both cases, is quite different. Um, and heleri and maculatus are a lab cross between species that are about three million years diverged. So they don't naturally hybridize. Um, and I had sort of always interpreted this case as some molecular dysfunction that might happen in these really deeply diverged species. Um, so just to give you a sense of that, um, so uh, the maculatus and heleri crosses between these distantly related clades, they don't naturally hybridize. Um, there have been some really nice classical behavioral experiments where you can keep them together in no choice mating conditions for, for um, many years and they will never hybridize. Um, so it's sort of a, an interesting molecular dysfunction but a really different case um, than these um, closely related species where we see natural hybridization and this pattern in the wild. Okay, so the next thing that um, we wanted to understand was um, what's going on when you see a transition from this normal spot to a melanoma. So to do that, we took an admixture mapping approach using our local ancestry calling from our hybrid populations um, and the phenotypes that we had collected. Um, so 
the first thing we wanted to do was to confirm that in hybrids, the genetic basis of the spot was the same as in the parental species. Um, because it seems like it should obviously be true, but anyone who's worked with genomic data knows that sometimes you have unpleasant surprises like that. Um, so the first thing we, we did was basically classify our hybrid individuals. We had um, about 230 hybrids as spotted or not spotted. And when we perform, perform admixture mapping on this trait, we see a single association with Birchmite ancestry on chromosome 21. So what that means is individuals that had Birchmite ancestry in the same region that we previously identified are more likely to be spotted. If instead we sort of split things not by spotted and unspotted, but by individuals that have this sort of Birchmite-like spot that is contained and uh, versus individuals that have evidence of melanin invasion, um, we can map that trait, which is sort of an independent trait. Um, and if we do that, interestingly, we still see this Birchmite associated region on chromosome 21, uh, but we now identify a second region on chromosome 5 that is associated with Malinche ancestry. So the implication is that if you combine these two regions of Malinche and Birchmite ancestry, that could result in the melanoma. So we can evaluate this specifically because we can look at individual genotypes and ask if that is the case. So if we split our individuals by genotype and we ask within a genotype class who has melanoma and who doesn't, um, we can see that sort of as expected, you have to have Birchmite ancestry at the spotting locus to have melanoma. If you don't have a spot, you're not gonna have melanoma. Um, but at chromosome five, you have to have at least one Malinche allele. Um, and what's quite interesting is heterozygotes, individuals that have a Malinche and a Birchmite allele at this region, have a much lower incidence of melanoma, suggesting that a single Birchmite allele is protective against melanoma at this region. Um, and we can sort of push this a little further and ask about individuals in this category that don't have melanoma and individuals in this category that don't have melanoma and ask about the size of their spots um, as sort of that independent or not independent but semi-independent verification. And what you see is that individuals, even if they don't have melanoma, that are homozygous Malinche at this region on chromosome five have bigger spots than individuals that are heterozygous. Um, so this really suggests to us that, that we're kind of capturing some of the genetic architecture of what's going on here. Okay, so what's in this region on chromosome five? Well, um, we actually ended up being extremely lucky with where this QTL fell. Um, with admixture mapping, um, you often have much larger associated regions, but this happens to be in a very high recombination rate region of the genome, um, which meant that we actually only had two genes in this region, um, which makes it uh, much more tractable to kind of drill down into what's going on. So one of these genes was a fatty acid transporter, and we pretty quickly excluded it as a likely cause. I'm happy to talk more about it and the work that we did to look at it. Um, but the second gene in this region was a gene called CD97. And as we started to look into what was going on with this gene in our hybrids, we became very interested in it. So one of the first things that we found was this gene is misregulated in many cancers and that there's been quite a lot of functional work that suggests that it's misregulation actually drives melanoma, um, sorry, drives metastasis in several different human cancers. So that seemed like a, a possibly good candidate for us. Um, one of the other things that we noticed about this gene as we looked at it was that there's a derived substitution in, um, in uh, sorry, I lost track of what I, um, a derived substitution in Birchmanai um, that uh, might uh, disrupt binding in this epidermal growth factor binding domain. And Xmark is actually an epidermal growth factor protein. So there's a potentially direct interaction here um, that we're really excited to look at in more detail. Okay, but what I think is sort of most attracted to us about this particular gene is some of the expression patterns that we're able to see 
in hybrids in the parental species. So one of the first things that we noticed after we identified it is that there was much higher expression in individuals with melanoma compared to those with no uh, spot or, or sort of a more normal birch smile like expression. Um, and so we've been trying to understand what's driving this difference, whether it's an ancestry-based difference. Um, and what we can um, see using a qPCR-based approach is that there appears to be much higher expression of this gene in Malinche than in Birchmanai. And this is based on the caudal tissue itself. So this is the, the tissue in which the melanoma would develop. However, we see this in every single tissue that we look at. So it appears to be sort of a global higher expression of this gene. Um, and what's quite interesting is that in both F1 and natural hybrids, we see sort of a Malinche-like expression level. So our working model, which we're still kind of doing additional experiments to try to understand and refine, is that um, through inheritance of Malinche ancestry in this region, potentially combined with, um, with these substitutions that have occurred in these conserved domains, um, individuals with Malinche ancestry and a spot are not able to regulate the expansion of that spot. Um, so that's um, sort of where we are at the moment in trying to understand the architecture of this incompatibility. So I want to just step back a moment um, and talk about what's going on on an evolutionary scale here. Um, so I told you about um, what we found between Birchmai and Malinche, where you have um, a melanoma that develops due to this interaction between a gene called Xmark and this CD97 region. Um, and I also told you about this sort of classical model of, um, of melanoma and sore tails, where you cross these deeply divergent species and you have this interaction between Xmark and what's actually an unknown partner gene, um, but they believe that it's this gene called CDNK2X, um, but it's not been mapped to the single gene level. And so what that suggests is we actually have a genetically distinct hybrid incompatibility um, that shares part of its architecture and differs in the interacting locus. And we've done a lot of simulations to evaluate um, and, and confirm that we have power to detect this locus if it really had an effect on melanoma in this case. Um, so I think this is, is really interesting because we have so few examples of hybrid incompatibilities that have been mapped to the single gene level that we don't really know how common these kind of repeated use of genes in incompatibilities are. The only other known case of a incompatibility gene in vertebrates is the um, recombination regulator PRDM9. And that case appears to cause incompatibility in multiple species crosses. So um, one of the things that we've been having fun speculating about and thinking about for, for future work is whether you might see these kinds of cases um, over and over again as we begin to map these interactions to the single gene level. You know, when you have these very distinct crosses, do you see that the same gene sort of break down in hybrids over and over? And I think that's an extremely open question and an ambitious one we probably won't get to um, in the next, uh, it will probably take a couple decades to, to get enough examples to evaluate that. Um, but I think it's a really important question in understanding the nature of these barriers between hybrids, hybridizing species. Okay, so for the last part of my talk, I'm gonna sort of switch gears. I've put you through a lot of genetics um, and talk about what's going on in the natural hybrid populations. Um, so one would assume that melanoma is bad um, but, you know, it's sort of unclear what's going on with these fish. They're short-lived. They only live a couple of years. Um, they reproduce early. Maybe it doesn't have a big impact on them in terms of a, a fitness perspective. Um, so one of the things that we focused on is trying to understand the sort of transition between juveniles and adults and how the phenotype changes over that time period. Um, so juveniles often sort of have like a uh, budding melanoma, but it's not very serious. But often by the time those individuals are adults, they have sort of a full-fledged aggressive melanoma. Um, and this is also the time period where individuals 
transition from being sub-reproductive to reproductive. Um, so this seems like a reasonable time point to sort of focus our efforts on understanding. So if um, the melanoma has an impact on survival independent of the spot, um, we would expect to not see a big difference in juvenile and adult frequency of the spot in populations that don't have melanoma. So we can look at this with our birch mite population and also with some of our hybrid populations. Um, so for example, the Aguacerca population has the spot, but it seems to have lost Malinche ancestry at the interacting locus. And so we don't find individuals that have melanoma out of many hundreds sampled from this population. And what we see is that sort of as predicted from our lab tracking of hybrids, we see sort of a slight uptick in the number of spotted individuals between juvenile and adult stages. Because the spot gets bigger at times, it's easier to identify in adults. Similarly, in birch mite, we don't really see much of a change, um, or, and even in that population, not much of an uptick. But if we then go and look at populations, hybrid populations that have high rates of melanoma, we see a really different pattern where we actually have quite a high frequency of the spot in juveniles and a lower frequency in adults. And we see this in both of the hybrid populations where we have a high degree of melanoma. Um, and we've actually sampled over three years now and are able to replicate this pattern each year. So this suggests um, that something's going on between that juvenile and adult stage that's um, sort of changing um, changing the composition of the population. Um, and I do want to stress here that we're not directly measuring fitness because we're not measuring the reproductive output of spotted and non-spotted individuals, um, but we are getting a measure of viability selection by looking at these sort of frequency changes between juveniles and adults, um, which we, um, you know, has some relationship to their fitness. So if we, so we use um, an ABC approach to try to infer what viability selection coefficients are consistent with this reduction in frequency between juveniles and adults. Um, and what we see, we can do that independently in our two populations. Uh, what we see is we get very well resolved posterior distributions of consistent viability selection coefficients. Um, so in both populations, we estimate the viability selection coefficient to be about 0.2, um, which of course is extremely strong. Um, and again, we don't know exactly how this maps onto reproductive output, but we would expect it to be under sort of quite strong selection in the population. So um, we have been thinking through and trying to, to understand the mechanism of this selection. I said earlier that um, we don't really think there's a systemic effect. We don't think individuals die from melanoma. Um, and that's just based on individuals we have in the lab. But what we do see is individuals get some phenotypes that could be quite bad in the wild. So this is a female that has a pretty invasive melanoma. And her, her caudal fin would normally go to here. Um, so she's had um, pretty severe degradation of the caudal fin. Um, so that's one phenotype we see in the lab. Another. Um, is a sort of dramatic tumor overgrowth. Um, so this is an individual from the top down, and you can see this, this tumor growing on both sides of the caudal fin, um, and that's the same individual from the side. Um, so seeing these phenotypes, we, we sort of um, assume that it would have a pretty strong impact on swimming performance, so we've been trying to quantify that, and of course, in the wild, um, swimming performance is important both for escaping predators, um, but also predators are going to see these giant spots. Um, I can sort of anecdotally, we've been trying to figure out how to quantify this, but anecdotally I can say standing on the side of the river, it's easier to see individuals that look like this than individuals with no spots. So these things might compound each other. Um, so we've um, been trying a couple of different measures of swimming performance, and we've focused on escape performance. Um, mainly. So one of the things, um, so sword tails are teleos fish, and one um, feature that, that's shared by teleos fish is that when they're startled, they do something called a, a C start response. So they sort of curve 
and then and and have sort of this escape reflex. And so um, this is thought to be a fairly consistent response over multiple measures, and it's a reflex response. So we thought it would be a good way to measure sort of the physiological capacity of these individuals to escape. Um, so basically what we do is we set up individuals in this grid structure, um, and we wait for an individual to swim into a particular grid, and then we drop a, a marble into a controlled position in another grid. Um, and basically we then use a, um, a high-speed camera to track the path that that fish moves in the first 50 milliseconds after the stimulus. And we use that as a measure of their sort of escape ability. Um, and as you might sort of obviously expect from looking at those fish pictures, individuals that have low or no invasion um, are, uh, get further than individuals that have the um, more substantial invasion. And we have a couple examples of those individuals with the extreme tumors that basically barely move at all in response to the stimulus. Um, so we think that this, in combination with some of um, potentially the visibility differences between these individuals, could be the mechanism of selection on these individuals in the wild. So this raises an obvious puzzle, which I'm sure you have all thought about, uh, which is why do we see this trait in any of our hybrid populations? Why hasn't, it, hasn't it been purged? Um, so if we take our simulations of viability selection, our posterior distribution, and we perform posterior predictive simulations, sampling those selection coefficients and asking what should happen in the hybrid population over time, this is what we expect. We expect that trait to drop in frequency and be purged very quickly, certainly by the time frame that we're looking at in our natural hybrid populations. Um, so that suggests that the situation, as it often is in biology, is more complicated. Um, there may be um, so a couple of possibilities which we're, we're considering and pursuing are you know, the, the effects on viability during development may be much lower than the effects on fitness. So individuals may reproduce mostly in their first couple months of being reproductively active. That would certainly lower the impact of this trait. Um, or there's a possibility that there's countervailing selection, um, that there might be preferences for these kinds of traits or some sort of balancing selection at play. Um, and that's something we're certainly excited to look at in the future. Um, so I just want to end with sort of one thought, which is um, this incompatibility that I told you about today, and we spent you know, the last couple of years doing a lot of work to dissect and understand, is just one of a lot of sites that we think are under selection in natural hybrids between these two species. And of course, this is just one pair of species out of many across the tree of life that are actively hybridizing. So obviously, we have a lot of work to do to understand what's going on in general with hybrid incompatibilities, what kinds of genes, what kind of processes. Um, and then stepping back even further, um, we have a huge amount to do to understand not just the genetic interactions, but how hybrids are impacted by other sources of selection in their environments. And hopefully um, pursuing these different things will help us understand um, the evolutionary importance of these genomic contributions of hybridization over evolutionary timescales. Um, I want to end by thanking my lab, Dan Powell, who's a postdoc in the lab, has led all of this work that I talked about today. Um, and he's been helped by three t amazing technicians, Mackenzie, Shreya, and, and Danny. And a, a grad student um, has been collaborating with him in another lab. Um, I've had great mentors and collaborators, and I'm very grateful for funding sources. Thank you. Yes, so in the parental species, the trait is polymorphic. Um, and um, sort of stepping back from birch fly, where, where it's polymorphic, if you go out to the most close relative, it is also polymorphic in that species, which suggests quite strongly that there's some 
sort of balancing selection um, that has maintained it at intermediate frequencies over you know, the, the divergence between Birchmai and Cortezi, the most closely related species outside of this group, is about a million and a half years. So it's quite hard to maintain a neutral polymorphism for that long, but we do not understand the source of balancing selection. Yeah, so to answer your last question first, the time scale is too long for that. Um, but I, we haven't totally excluded it. So um, we have um, some experimental pedigrees, and we're trying to track the trait in those pedigrees um, to address some of these sorts of questions. Um, we think that female preference for this big spot could be one of the reasons that it's maintained. We do not see genetic or phenotypic correlations between the spot and other sexually selected traits, like the sword or the dorsal fin or the vertical bars. Did I miss any of your questions? No. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we, we haven't, we're, we have, set up crosses in the lab. Uh, we don't know yet. Um, the, the further, I mean, it's already hard. Sometimes we get Bershaw and Malinche to mate. So the further you go out, the harder it is to get them to mate. They, it doesn't, it's not the case that they're less viable, um, but it is hard to get them to mate. Um, so we're trying those crosses. So in particular, I'm very interested in whether um, if you cross Cortezi and Malinche, you have the same incompatibility architecture or not, because the substitutions in the interacting gene are slightly different. Um, so that might be a way for us to get at that question. And that would also be interesting if you can't see them both have the same thing, yes. yet you still have incompatibility. Yes, and we, nobody has done that to my knowledge in any of the species that have these spotting patterns. Um, yeah, so, and I will just say that there's another hybrid zone between um, variatus and a species called Nezawal Kyoto, which we call Nezi. Um, and that hybrid zone also appears to have a natural cancer incompatibility. So we're super excited to try to understand is that, you know, again, X mark and an independent locus. Is it one of these two that have been mapped before? So yeah, there's a lot, a lot to do. I'm trying to not get down the cancer rabbit hole too much, but. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, so we have two full clines. Um, and in one of the hybrid zones, it's very clinal and very tight with the genome-wide cline. And in the other, it appears to be intergressed um, in one direction. So um, it, yeah, so we don't quite know, but we've been thinking that that might provide some, some clues. It seems to be different across populations. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Uh-huh. So do you mean of, sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh-huh. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know anything about about that, but it sounds really interesting. <laughs> 
Yes. So do you mean the sort of variation in hybrid ancestry over space or? Um, or Yeah, so certainly they're ecologically specialized. And so we, we have one river um, that I often don't talk about, but I think is super informative, where we don't have hybrids. Um, and um, in that river, we see basically the parental species extend to the elevations where we typically find hybrids, but they're kind of rare there. Um, and they sort of barely overlap. So we think that's sort of like the the basic structure on which hybridization began to occur. So it does seem like the, the parental species are ecologically limited. Um, and I'm sure that interacts with you know, ancestry and the hybrids and which hybrids can live where. Um, and there's a whole lot of stuff to do in that area. Yeah, so. Um, we think, so we, we haven't worked on this as much and we're hoping to work on it more. Um, one thing we see is that hybrids um, have intermediate thermal tolerance and they can live at a broader range of thermal environments. Um, and that's sort of predicted from the, the thermal tolerance of the parental species. Um, so that could be an example of that, but it's sort of more of an intermediacy trait. Um, that we do see, evidence of epistatic traits or transgressive traits in hybrids. Um, we were talking about the dorsal fin earlier. Um, we have not looked at whether any of those provide advantages in, in particular environments. Um, you know, one thing that might be really good to look at is swimming performance because both the sword and dorsal fin are likely to impact swimming performance. And, and you know, these are, they're not super fast moving rivers, but you know, they do, um, they do have to swim against a current frequently. Yeah. It seems to me that they might have a similar kind of biological history or recent history of whole group, but there were particular outcomes yeah. of these secondary contacts. Now, do you have any idea of what determines this, uh, this outcome? The, which may parent is the majority ancestry? Yeah. Yeah, we, um, so we, our first guess would be like some kind of elevational, I mean, assuming, so like, you know, if it's some kind of selection and not just a demographic accident, you need to be it to be like quite a polygenic trait um, to, to drive a genome wide signal. Um, so we were thinking, oh, well, like, you know, what's likely to poly be polygenic? Well, you know, temperature affects every, every gene in the cell. Um, or every protein in the cell. And so we looked at correlation between elevation and genome-wide mixture, and we actually don't see a correlation there. I don't know if we don't have power or, you know, demography is also, I mean, there's quite a lot probably that's determined by the initial mixture. Um, and that's very hard for us to study because we can't go back in time yet, so. <laughs> yeah, what is interesting is that it's very similar to what, for example, Brazil yeah. has populations of Maori. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And actually we've been trying to get at it, I mean, I don't know if this will work, but we set up artificial hybrid populations at three elevations um, and eight replicates per elevation. So if there is some kind of genome-wide shift that's you know, elevationally mediated, I mean, they're not in the rivers, they're in big concrete tanks next to the river, but um, you know, hopefully we would begin to see it there. But. Thanks.